again, this uh, I wanted to use as a way to really bring these concepts home of evaluating your total outs, what your equity is in yeah, certain situations. And for that, I want to go back to what we were just looking at uh, with the push calculator. And then take this scenario here where we have our ace, king of uh, spades, and yeah, the respective villain's potential, potential hands on that flop, just to show you how that changes in the calculator itself. Same scenario, just recap that. Small blind, big blind, open raiser, we call for four. Guy three bets us light to 16. One call, two calls, and flop comes. Open raiser checks, we check behind. And the three better, the squeezer, makes his standard C bet of two thirds pot size, which is in this case $33 dollars at 33 big blinds. Open raiser folds and again we have this 2.5 to 1 odds as you always will when somebody bets two-thirds pot into you and you need 29 percent equity to make that call. We saw previously right, that we're gonna have that 25 and pretty much a well, not a worst case scenario of course we saw where we had 1 percent equity but we're going to have that 25% even when we just have the 8 out plus draw say. Um, let's bring that down here, actually back up. And again, if we give ourselves 8 outs, you know, 31% minus the potential redraws, whatever, 25. Um, forgive me, wrong cell. 25% <laughs> for our equity here. And his fold equity, if we assume that he never folds his trips or whatever. Um, we're going to lose 30 bucks in the long run with our assumed monster draw. We thought we had 15 out, we didn't have but 8, and the guy had a redraw to a full house. So, there you go. <laughs> Whoopsie! Yeah, miscounted outs can be catastrophic, especially when super big stacks, say super deep stack. Uh, let's just, whatever, for example purposes, give ourselves 160 remaining. Yeah. Yeah, all of a sudden, <laughs> your expected value drops markedly, but of course, when you're pushing that big, fold equity will go up. Let's look at a, a situation where, again, we flopped our overcards, as we will on 66% of flops with the ace-king, and our flush draw, but the guy had queen-king, as we had seen. So again, around 12 outs, and here for 12 outs, right at, yeah, 44, 45% equity. And, yeah, even if this guy never folds, already at 45%, we're in the green. And the more he folds, the more we win. So, at this point, if, um, if he never lets go of that top pair, ever, we're going to win 12 bucks in the long run. But that means in the long run, guys. And if you're playing, if this is your entire bankroll, for example, um, you don't want to go bet in the farm, on 45% equity here in this in this scenario, uh, you need to always adhere to bankroll management and again adjust accordingly. But um, if you're playing where you have 15 to 20 to even 30 rebuys, you can make these kind of pushes with without any worries because you know you're winning money in the long run. If you're shaking in your boots every time you make an all-in push because you're playing over your means, then yeah, you're not playing. Yeah, I mean you're gambling. You're not. You're not a player at that point, you're a gambler. So be be clear with that distinction and always do adhere to bankroll management so, so that you can make these kind of positive EV moves without having a stroke or heart attack in the process. <laughs> All right, let's say, for example, that the guy didn't flop the set, he didn't flop the top pair, blocking one of our over cards, and we have the full 53% equity. Sitting very pretty at 29 bucks for our flop push even when he never folds, and let's say he folds maybe 30% of the time. I mean, that's just huge EV given an effective stack of uh, 100 big blinds, and in this case the EV, the, the monetary amount is 1 to 1 with our big blind count. So guys, that was pretty much all that I wanted to cover in this second video, and I believe with that we've shown you everything that you'll see in actually pretty much all limits 
And of course, as mentioned previously, and I will mention again, you can break down any of these concepts into multiple videos. They're very, very profound, very, very complex, uh, especially as you move into the higher limits. But you as recreational, potentially novice players, and even some seasoned players will hopefully have gotten a lot out of that because now you will have seen pretty much everything that a very good, very educated player can throw at you. Uh, you've also seen the mathematical background for um, yeah, the reasons for such plays. You've seen the odds that you're both getting and giving. Uh, you've seen different lines of play, again, here with, uh, with this video, different pot manipulation strategies, when you should play your hands fast, betting and raising, re-raising, when you should slow play them, uh, i.e. on non-connected dry boards, especially in Texas Hold'em. In pot limit Omaha, almost never slow bet, uh, almost never slow play, because the likelihood of somebody having flopped uh, sets is just way too high. And of course, when that board pairs, your uh, previously uh, monster straight or flush draw, and or <laughs> uh, and or completed or flop uh, monster straight uh, without a redraw to the full house is very very vulnerable against again flop sets and many other potential holdings. So Pot Limit Omaha almost never slow play and hold them of course it works. Uh, be very careful when you are on two suited boards and connected boards and you can change it of course from time to time where you don't protect on the flop especially maybe in heads up or, or three way pots where you don't think it's very likely that your opponents are on flush draws. You can also in that position play slow and then make a move on the turn both in and out of position that's also possible. But in general, go ahead and protect anytime you see two suited boards and hold them. Anytime it's connected, don't slow play it. And yeah, always, again, I'll just say that one last time. <laughs> uh, big hand does not mean over pair. Big hand does not mean top pair, top kicker. Big hand does not mean any top pair, especially full ring. This also applies to six max, and okay, and, and heads up, yes, top pair is, there's an adage, of course, top pair in heads up play, just you and another opponent, is the nuts. There is that adage. So the fewer opponents you get, the more likely it is, of course, that he or she will have missed, and when you do have that top pair over pair, it's also very strong in general. However, <laughs> even in heads up play, uh, when you get action against a non-creative, kind of rocky kind of player, be ready for a real shocker if you if you play on with your top pair over pair, as I just illustrated with multiple examples. Uh, this is even more so, of course, in in six max play and yeah, in full ring play you can forget it. Of course, top pair hands and over pair hands are very good very often at a showdown, but you don't want to be overplaying them and you very often want to play them for pot control both in and out of position so yeah that coupled with all of the tables that I showed you guys for hitting playable flops uh, the tables and the analysis that I showed you from the other two poker strategy sites there uh, for the probability that your opponents will have missed certain flops all this information you can definitely incorporate uh, incorporate into your play at this point and I think even even with this if you if you properly comprehend everything that I've explained to you here in the first two videos of this sub-series, you'll be light years ahead of all your competition. And that we want to solidify then in the coming third video where we'll put all this theory into practice for you. Again, this is Dylan. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was very useful. And I'm looking forward to working with you here in this third and final video in our sub-series we'll, uh, where we'll get into uh, quite a few examples for you guys to really bring these concepts home and uh, illustrate exactly where and how you can utilize them against various opponents in your play.